This is Lecture 17, Infringement and the Scope of the Patent Right. The agenda for this lecture is to first discuss the concept of indirect infringement and the rules of contributory and inducement infringement, both of which are versions of indirect infringement. Then we're going to talk about divided infringement. Uh, the basic rule here is that a uh, single entity uh, must infringe each and every element of a patent claim. Uh, as we'll find out, that has particular relevance to method claims and interacts with indirect infringement in an interesting way. Then we're going to talk about the territorial scope of patents. Uh, similar to divided infringement, this interacts with the indirect infringement concept to, to determine how um, patents can be infringed um, even if part of them are used in the U.S. and part of them not in the U.S. Um, that's, that's part of the, uh, uh, the analysis here. And then we're going to talk about patent exhaustion, which is the limits of patent infringement. When you sell a device uh, that's embodied by a patent, um, you are said to have exhausted the patent. And so we'll talk about that as well. So in, in infringement of patents uh, also has uh, 271, which establishes infringement. Um, it says that inducement, um, active, whoever actively induces infringement, uh, shall be liable as an infringer, as well as uh, somebody who um, uh, contributes to the infringement of a patent can be liable as an infringer as well. Um, and so uh, indirect infringement really consists, consists of two types, inducement infringement and contributory infringement. Inducement, you can see here in 271B, active inducement, and C, uh, describes contributory infringement, um, uh, a, uh, and so that's the, the second piece. The key case here uh, that I had you read was Lucent versus Gateway, which is a 2009 Federal Circuit opinion. And Lucent, uh, the technology here uh, is a generally directed to a method of entering information uh, into a computer without using a keyboard, uh, basically using either a tablet type interface, maybe a finger, um, or uh, other uh, ways of entering information, primarily through menus. And in particular here, um, uh, the issue was in some of Microsoft's software, uh, the, there was a, a date picker, uh, which allowed you to choose dates uh, without using a keyboard, uh, using some sort of pointing mechanism, uh, you would pick dates uh, from, for example, a, a, a small calendar displayed on the screen. That was sort of the essence of, of this patent here. Um, and so that was the, uh, the question um, for um, the court. So one of the issues here um, in Lucent versus Gateway the basic claim uh, was methods of using on-screen tools to input information, and Microsoft sells software which might infringe when used. So why, why is Microsoft being accused of indirect infringement? Well here, it has to be, Lucent has to claim indirect infringement because there's no evidence that Microsoft itself used the date picker. I mean, it, they may have, but Lucent doesn't have that uh, doesn't have that information, doesn't have that evidence. What they do have evidence is, is that some of the users of Microsoft software uh, have used the date picker. Uh, and because Microsoft is selling the software uh, together with some instructions on how to use it, uh, its indirect infringement is the claim against Microsoft. Well, why wouldn't Lucent just sue the end users who are the ones who are actually directly infringing uh, the method? Well, the easy answer to that is there's a lot of them. Uh, and so to effectively stop the infringement, they'd have to file enormous numbers of lawsuits. and It would be pretty complicated and expensive. And second, no individual, of course, is going to have any significant resources uh, to recover damages from. So it wouldn't be worth it for Lucent to spend money litigating their patent against each and every possible direct infringer. So it's important for Lucent to actually have protection, to actually uh, enable its patent rights to be um, implemented 
here in the marketplace that it can sue a company like Microsoft, which allegedly, in this case, uh, is uh, engaging in activities which, although not direct infringement, uh, are uh, indirectly causing uh, the infringement of uh, the patent. So the first issue that the court um, considers is the one of contributory infringement, right? And the, the key here is whoever offers to sell or sells in the United States or imports into the United States a component of a patented machine, a manufacturer, a combination or a composition, or a material or apparatus for use in practicing a patented process constituting a material part of the invention, knowing the same to be especially made or especially adapted for use in infringement, and not a staple article or commodity of commerce suitable for substantial non-infringing uses. Right? So this is what really the, the issue of contributory infringement turns upon, which is the uh, 271C is quite clear that even if, even if you are, in a sense, selling, a, uh, in this case, a software product which, would, um, uh, which is uh, able to be used in a way that infringes Lucent's patent, even if you do that, you can still nonetheless not be a contributory infringer if your uh, software has non-infringing uses, substantial non-infringing uses. And the argument that Microsoft makes is that the software has many non-infringing uses. This is a very large software program. This is Microsoft Word, for example. Microsoft Money was another one. Outlook was another one and that these programs are multi-featured. They have lots of, of uh, uses, uh, almost all of which are non-infringing, and therefore, Microsoft says, there can be no contributory infringement because their um, uh, product is uh, capable uh, of substantial non-infringing use. Lucent says, well, no, you're not looking at this the right way, that in fact, this date picker tool which is what we are accusing of infringement, uh, itself doesn't have non-infringing uses, right? All the uses of the date picker tool uh, infringe uh, the relevant patent, and that therefore, because of that, contributory infringement is okay, right? The court answers this, this question in favor of Lucent. I mean, this, this is really a question about how how you're supposed to analyze. What's the correct frame of analysis for substantial non-infringing uses? Is it the entire computer program, in which case all of the features come in, or is it the subset of the computer program that's being accused of infringement? Right? And the court decides it's the latter. Right? It, that, that is indeed the frame of reference that you should use when analyzing substantial non-infringing uses is the uh, aspect of the computer program that's being accused of infringement, right? And because Lucent wasn't accusing the rest of the features of Outlook, for example, or Microsoft Money um, uh, of infringing, they were merely accusing the date picker tool of being the infringing component, um, that that was the suitable, that was the correct frame of analysis, right? And the court says on page 538 that here the infringing feature for completing the forms, the date picker tool, is suitable only for an infringing use. Inclusion of the date picker feature within a larger program does not change the date picker's ability to infringe. Because Microsoft included the date picker tool in Outlook, the jury could reasonably conclude, based on the evidence presented, that Microsoft intended computer users to use the tool, perhaps not frequently, and the only intended use of the tool infringed the day patent. Right. So the court uh, thought that the correct frame of analysis, again, was the date picker tool itself and not the entire software product. And the next question, and therefore the court found that it was okay um, to uh, allow the jury's decision to stand with respect to contributory infringement. Next, the inducement infringement uh, question. Right? You'll note that inducement infringement has significantly fewer components to it. Right? Uh, contributory infringement suggests a, um, uh, that there is uh, the substantial non-infringing use exception. Here, um, there's none of that. It simply says if you actively induce infringement, uh, you have to be liable to his infringer. 
So what must Lucent show in order to, um, to show that Microsoft was actively inducing, right? Um, the, the basic rule here is that the plaintiff has the burden of showing that the alleged infringer's actions induced infringing acts and that he knew or should have known that his actions would induce actual infringements, right? A threshold finding of a direct infringement, of course, is always required. And then most importantly, inducement requires evidence of culpable conduct directed to encouraging someone else's infringement, not merely that you knew that there was infringement, right? So the mental state for inducement infringement is higher than for contributory infringement. At least that's the theory. The idea is that you have to show some sort of culpable intent with respect to inducement infringement. Um, and uh, and so that's the question here, right? So Lucent needs to show that Microsoft uh, had some sort of uh, intent uh, that its users, some sort of culpable intent that its users infringe uh, the relevant patent. Um, and Microsoft argued that there's, you know, there's all that Lucent can show is that the products when sold could be used, if the date pickers were used, for example, uh, to infringe the relevant patent, but that they did not necessarily encourage that behavior, and in any event, there was no culpable intent. Right? Um, the, what Lucent's argument is, is that by shipping the product, right, by having um, uh, some, uh, by having the product features uh, in, in, as part of the overall software package, by including documentation, which explained the usage of these features, Microsoft obviously intended that people actually use these features. Right? It wouldn't make any sense to include something like a date picker if you actually intended people not to use it. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the court, although it thought the evidence was relatively thin, agreed that the jury could find uh, the requisite level of intent uh, for people to infringe on the part of Lucent. Right? Uh, they particularly relied on page 539 and 540 on the, uh, on the expert, uh, Lucent's expert, who said, basically that, that it was clear that when you put these features into a software program, at some level you're intending the users uh, of the software program to use those uh, particular aspects as well, right? Um, and so uh, because of that, the, the court again allowed the jury uh, decision to stand, right? Um, and, uh, and so that's the, the issue of contributory infringement or sorry, of inducement infringement. I mean, here's, here's a way this chart, I think, sets out how to think about the differences between the two uh, uh, analyses. So inducement infringement under 271B, contributory is 271C. Uh, the elements for inducement are direct infringement and some culpable conduct. Usually, we think of this as intent um, uh, by intend that you intend your end users to engage in the infringement. And there's some knowledge requirement as well, uh, specific intent, some sort of knowledge that the acts infringe the patent. Um, SEB versus Global Tech, which is a Supreme Court case, which actually came out after the casebook was written, um, which will probably be featured in the next edition of the casebook. Um, you don't need to know that now, other than under SEB, uh, this knowledge requirement for inducement can be uh, found by willful blindness. So if you uh, actively avoid trying to find out about the patent, for example, or actively avoid trying to find out whether or not your users are going to actually infringe the patent, um, then that is just the same, according to the court and SEB versus Global Tech, that uh, as knowing about the patent and knowing that the acts would, would engage in infringement. Uh, an inducement infringement doesn't have a, a geographic, ex geographic uh, scope. It can happen anywhere although there has to be a direct in in infringement somewhere in the United States, of course. Um, so contributory infringement right, has the elements of direct infringement. Uh, it requires the defendant sold some material part of the invention, probably some sort of knowledge requirement, uh, although it's not clear what the knowledge requirement is, uh, and uh, no substantial non-infringing uses. And of course, that's the big uh, issue. The big limitation on contributory infringement is the issue of substantial non-infringing uses. 
Um, under SEB, uh, in contributory infringement, you have to uh, know about the patent of the and of the capability for infringement, right? So that's the knowledge requirement. Uh, and then whatever acts, uh, your contributory acts must occur in the United States for contributory infringement. So that's the way that, that inducement and contributory relate to each other. One thing you might note, particularly in the aftermath of SEB, where willful blindness now becomes a, an aspect of uh, that's good enough for the knowledge requirement and inducement, is that inducement has become a much more powerful way of arguing for indirect infringement than contributory infringement, right? It used to be uh, that inducement, we would think of inducement as being a much harder case to make because you had to show a fairly specific sort of intent uh, for people to infringe. But here it's not clear after SEB that you do have to show that specific type of intent. Instead, you can show willful blindness um, or maybe even something less uh, depending on, on how strongly you believe the types of, of language that the court used in, in Global Tech versus SEB. So I think what that means is that over the long term you're going to see a lot more cases brought under inducement infringement under 271B than you will under contributory infringement under 271C because it's, it seems like the um, uh, plaintiffs are going to have a much easier chance to win under inducement uh, than uh, uh, by meeting all of the factors required for contributory infringement. So one flag uh, is uh, under the new American Vents Act of 2011. Um, the, uh, there's an advice uh, of counsel um, and you failing to seek advice of counsel regarding your potential infringement liability uh, cannot be used against you um, uh, in the sense that you intended to induce. So if you simply fail to get an a attorney's opinion, that is not uh, intent uh, to induce infringement of the patent. Um, Let's look next at the idea of divided infringement. So let's start by thinking about what it is. So divided infringement is the case where you have multiple parties who infringe a claim. And what I mean by that is this is the limelight versus the Akamai versus limelight claim here. Uh, and you can see the various elements, content delivery method comprising and then there's several elements to this method claim. Tagging, serving, resolving, and then serving. Um, the way that this case arose was that Limelight did most of these activities. This is a basically a caching system for uh, internet content delivery that allows for much higher speed um, of content that gets delivered to your customers uh, browsers. Uh, the way that Limelight's system operated was that they had their customers uh, and they told them how to do it and why they should do it and so forth, tag the various elements of the page uh, that they wanted cached and those elements are the ones that individually would get cached and then um, stored and served to the customer in a faster manner. So what happens here is that, that Limelight doesn't end up doing each and every element of the claim. Right, And the, the basic case law in this area is that all elements of a patent claim must be performed by the same actor or by the actor's agent, right? So under the direction and control of the same actor. So if you hire somebody to do an extra element in the claim, then you're still liable. But otherwise, it has to be you and only you doing everything in the claim. Now, this isn't that big a deal when it comes to um, machines, apparatus, uh, because basically one person has to operate the machine, make, use, or sell the machine, and all of the whole things together, right? The machine is, is sort of one item. And so you really don't have much of an issue of joint or divided infringement. Method claims, however, are a totally different story, right? In the method context, uh, it's quite possible to, to do part of the patent claims in one area or with one person and part of the patent claim uh, in another area or with another person. And so that can mean then that 
um, method claims can uh, avoid in being infringed if more than one person uh, accomplishes the method, even if put together the entire method is actually being done. Right? So each and every step of the claim method must be performed by a single entity uh, or under the direction of the control uh, of the same entity. And so why this rule? This is a strict rule. It's been in the federal circuit for um, about 20 years. And, and this derives basically for two reasons. One, the statutory language of 271A says that a party shall infringe all elements of the claim. So from the statutory text, you can draw uh, the idea that it is a single entity, a single party is supposed to infringe each element of the claim. And the other reason to have this rule is to avoid people being sucked into unwitting infringements, right? If we had a rule whereby uh, combinations of actors could create infringements, it's possible that people would infringe without even knowing. And there's no intent element to patent infringement, remember. So you could even unknowingly or unwittingly infringe a patent if you were merely doing one step of a claimed method. And so the Federal Circuit has long had this rule uh, that, that every element of a claim, whether it's a method or not, must be performed by the same entity or somebody controlling uh, that entity. Now this then gets tricky um, when it comes to uh, uh, the limelight case, right? Where we have this particular element of the claim that was at issue there being accomplished not by limelight themselves, but by limelight's customers. And so then the question is, did limelight induce infringement, right? So under the law, limelight clearly did not um, itself infringe, uh, but it may have induced. But no single actor performed all the steps, but Limelight certainly had the requisite level of knowledge under the SEB, the Global Tech versus SEB case that we read, to be liable for inducement infringement. They were directly telling their, um, uh, their customers how to accomplish this tagging element of the method claim. So there's no question there that they had the level of knowledge that would be required for inducement infringement. But because not a single entity accomplished all elements of the claim, there was no direct infringement. And so the question in the limelight, the Akamai versus limelight case, is whether the single party rule can apply in the inducement of some of these method claims. And the Federal Circuit looked at this um, in their version of the Akamai case. And what they did was said that, yes, indeed, you can have inducement in these cases even without an act of direct infringement. And they basically develop an, an exception for the single entity rule or an extension of the rule of inducement. The court, uh, the Federal Circuit was pretty careful to say it wasn't changing the law of infringement. It was trying to change uh, to um, adjust the law of inducement infringement, but in reality what they did was develop an exception for what infringement meant in this context and said where an entity performs all but one of the steps and then induces the last step um, as Limelight did here, then that is inducement infringement, notwithstanding that there's no direct infringement underlying. Right? And the reason that they did this was basically that, that they thought and they argued that Congress must have intended there to be contributory to, to be inducement infringement in these circumstances or else there would be a major exception to patent infringement um, that would just be there uh, and available for the taking, right? Get your customers to do one of the elements of a method patent claim and there you, you can avoid um, uh, any claims of infringement. And so that was their argument. The, the Supreme Court took the case and issued a, an opinion in June. It's a very short opinion I had you read. Um, it's a really sharp rebuke of the Federal Circuit um, and uh, just goes through and says, look, the Federal Circuit law on infringement is clear. Single entity rule 
um, applies, and all direct, uh, all indirect infringement must have an underlying act of direct infringement, and there's no exceptions possible to that rule. The court says to do otherwise would just sow all kinds of confusion about what infringement meant, how, in what context could we relax the rule for infringement, and so forth, uh, and therefore Limelight can't be an infringer. Um, the court, interestingly enough, in the in the Akamai case, does not decide whether or not the Federal Circuit is correct that each and every element of the claim has to be accomplished by the same entity, right? They just assume that that's correct. They, they expressly decline to address that issue, and instead they actually invite the Federal Circuit to, to reconsider that issue if they wish. They didn't say anything about it um, that I would read. Uh, as uh, suggesting the Federal Circuit should necessarily change the rule, uh, but the, um, the Supreme Court was clear that if the Federal Circuit wanted to revisit that rule, um, that that's the way to try and get at these cases of infringement, not to make an exception uh, for uh, inducement uh, that doesn't require an underlying act of direct infringement. Next, let's consider the territorial scope of patent rights. Um, as I noted at the outset of this uh, class session, in general, this is a pretty easy question. Either you infringe in the United States or you don't. Um, there are some important wrinkles, however. In the case uh, here um, that I had you read, the NTP versus RIM, uh, it involves one of those interesting wrinkles. Um, as a general matter, uh, it's real clear that, that uh, any uh, infringing activity, you make, use, sell, offer to sell, or sells any patent invention within the United States or imports into the United States any patent invention or sells within the United States a component of a patent machine um, can be uh, liable for um, infringement of a United States patent. And again, usually that's relatively simple. Uh, NTP is a different kind of case, and NTP was interesting because it's not so simple. Um, and the basic issue in NTP uh, was uh, that the way that the system worked, uh, this is of course the BlackBerry system, uh, the way that the various components of the NTP system worked is that they routed email uh, through servers in Canada uh, prior to forwarding them along through wireless networks to a user's actual handheld device, their BlackBerry. Uh, and so because of that routing, uh, that would take information, take emails uh, from uh, the United States and then route them through Canada before they were brought back. Uh, NTP, or actually RIM, argued uh, that they avoided the infringement of NTP's US-based patent because a substantial component uh, of the activities occurred outside the United States. All right. uh, and so that's the basic legal question is can RIM nonetheless be liable for infringement in the United States, although uh, the, the email system includes a major component, the control unit, uh, which actually exists in Canada and is used that way. And so this diagram shows reasonably well how this works. So the court ultimately finds that the system claims are used in the United States, but the method claims are not. Right? And so why are the system claims used in the U.S. even though a component of the system is outside the U.S.? Well, the way the court interprets use um, in this context is that what it means by use is uh, control and beneficial use, not necessarily use of all the components. And so to the court in NTP, what it was asked, what, it, what the analysis is, is you consider uh, for these purposes, where the control and beneficial use of, of the overall system is and not where each individual component of the system is. And because in this case the control and beneficial use that was asserted as infringement uh, was occurring inside the United States, um, the control was there, the beneficial use was there, the court says it doesn't matter that a component of the entire system uh, was outside the United States. Right? And this is on page 558 when RIMS customers send and receive messages manipulating, by manipulating the handheld devices in their possession in the United States. The location of the use uh, of the communication system as a whole occurs in the United States. Uh, 
This satisfactorily establishes the situs of the use of RIM system by RIM's United States customers for purposes of 270A, 271A is in the United States. And this is the control and beneficial use standard. Now, interestingly enough, the court decides that the method claims are not infringing in the United States under this analysis. And why? So why are method claims different? Well, it's important to understand that the court drew an import, a distinction between system claims, where it's, a, it's an overall system, an email system, for example, and method claims, which is a series of steps. Right? So method claims are nothing more than a series of steps, a one, a two, a three uh, that somebody follows. And what the court says is that in order to infringe a method claim, you have to follow each of the steps. Right? That, that, uh, and so uh, and it's different than, uh, than using an entire system. Right? So when you use a system, you don't necessarily have to use each single component in order to get an overall use out of the system. Whereas in order to um, uh, utilize a method, you have to follow each step. And for that reason, the court thought that the fact that a major step, an important, a critical step of uh, the method claims occurred outside the United States in Canada, that therefore the method claims could not be infringed uh, inside the United States uh, because not all the components uh, not all of the steps were practiced inside the United States. Right? Uh, what the court says is because a process is nothing more than the sequence of actions of which it is comprised, the use of a process necessarily involves doing or performing each of the steps recited. This is unlike use of a system as a whole in which components are used collectively, not individually. We therefore hold that a process cannot be used within the United States as required by Section 271A unless each of the steps is performed within this country. Right? So because of that, the system claims were found to be infringed, the method claims were not, right? at least under the use standard. Right? But you'll remember that use is not the only infringing act that's possible. Right? What NTP now says is, well, maybe they didn't use the patented process claims in the United States, but they sold or offered to sell them in the United States. I mean, indeed, they were RIM is advertising um, the, uh, the the system in the United States, trying to sell it to people, right? Uh, and so that is uh, the next argument that that NTP has is that in fact the way that that uh, RIM is selling the product is effectively selling. Uh, the patented process in the United States. Right? So here the court again finds that there can be no infringement. Right? Um, the, the issue here is that method claims, um, uh, the court says, are not sold. Right? They basically decide that what sale means in the context of make, use, sell, uh, and so forth in 271 of the Patent Act requires the, the transfer of some physical good and that you can't and that simply paying somebody to uh, to have the ability to follow a series of steps is not a sale of a patented process right uh, and so therefore you can't uh, even analyze method claims under the sell or offer to sell components you, you, you are limited in that sense in method claims to using um, uh, those processes rather than selling them. And so therefore the court declined uh, to find that, that uh, what RIM had done was sell or offer to sell uh, the accused infringing process claims. Right? Um, so uh, the, uh, what the court says is we conclude that, that RIM's performance of at least some of the recited steps of the asserted method claims as a service for its customers is not selling or offering to sell the invention covered by the asserted method claims. The sale or offer to sell handheld devices is not enough. We conclude as a matter of law that RIM did not sell or offer to sell the invention covered by the method claims within the United States. Again, because method claims cannot be sold in the, in the sense that 271 requires. So in the opinion of uh, NTP versus RIM, you will note uh, a lot of discussion about the Deep South case. Right? In the Deep South case, 
uh, was a Supreme Court case uh, that dealt with the issue of uh, whether or not uh, it was patent infringement to produce parts uh, for a patented invention, ship those parts overseas, uh, and then where they were assembled into the patented invention. Right? So the parts were not infringing, the argument uh, was, uh, until uh, they were assembled into the product and that, that assembly only occurred overseas and, and, and the patentee said, well, that's still infringement because they're effectively avoiding the patent by manufacturing only the parts in the United States and shipping them overseas for assembly. The Deep South case, uh, the Supreme Court held that that was not patent infringement, that the territorial scope of U.S. patents did not allow it to reach um, uh, when you assembled a product overseas uh, and that, that you couldn't use contributory or other uh, forms of indirect infringement to get at that. Um, 271F is a response to that. Uh, it's a response by Congress to the Deep South case uh, and what they've uh, concluded um, or what they wrote into the law is that you can't avoid infringement by supplying components for assembly outside the United States, right? So what would 271F um, directly states that if you produce components of a patented good in the United States with the, um, uh, with the intent um, uh, to actively induce their combination outside the United States, um, uh, then that is uh, a form of infringement just like any other, uh, and you can be liable for that. And again, this doesn't come up that often, but it did close what was seen was as an important, potentially important hole um, created by the, the interpretation of Deep South uh, by the Supreme Court. Finally, let's turn to patent exhaustion. The patent exhaustion doctrine stands for the principle that once you sell a patented product, the patent rights to that particular product terminate. Meaning if I sell you a toaster, for example, I can't claim later that you've infringed my patent on the toaster or the operation of the toaster um, uh, because I've sold you that product. And so your use of that product um, is uh, my patent rights are exhausted. Now, selling you a toaster doesn't give you the right uh, to create more toasters. Or, or to otherwise use my, um, uh, my patent, um, but it allows you the rights to use the patent with respect to that particular article uh, that was sold. Right? That's the basic concept of patent exhaustion. Um, and so this is similar, if those of you who had any copyright law, to the first sale doctrine. Right? The first sale doctrine in copyright law operates very similarly. Again, the basic idea is that once you sell a particular physical copy um, of, say, a book, um, that the person who owns that copy then has the right to do whatever it is that he or she wishes to do with the book um, short of creating more copies or, or otherwise uh, exploiting um, beyond the scope of what they've actually purchased. So um, that's again patent exhaustion. Um, one of the most important concepts uh, to understand in the patent context is this distinction that the courts make between repair and reconstruction. Repair um, falls within uh, your uh, implied rights, the rights that you get when you purchase a patented good. Reconstruction does not. Right. So in, in simple terms, repair is not infringement. Reconstruction is infringement. You are not allowed to reconstruct a patented good, i.e. make a new one, um, but you can repair the patented good that you already purchased. And the line between repair and reconstruction can be uh, difficult to discern in many cases. And one of those cases is the Jazz Photo case, 2001 Federal Circuit. Um, here, uh, Fuji is the... Um, Film is the patentee, uh, and Jazz Photo is a is a company um, that basically takes uh, these disposable quick snap cameras um, and uh, these single use cameras and uh, refurbishes them in various overseas facilities. All right, what they do um, is that they uh, um, that when they they obtain these 
um, shells of the, the particular cameras, um, and then they uh, remove the cardboard cover, cut open the plastic casing, insert new film and a container to receive the film, replace the winding wheel, replace the battery, reset the counter, resealing the case and adding a new cardboard cover. Right? And so the question is, is that repair or reconstruction? Right? Um, and so that's uh, the question that the court has to grapple with in this case. So the first thing to understand is that is that um, there's a burden shift here, right? So the patentee is proving infringement um, of their of the patent. Patent exhaustion is an affirmative defense, right? So it's a defense that the that the defendant has to raise and indeed prove. So if you prove that I have infringed your patent, I can defend myself by saying no, I haven't infringed. Um, your patent rights were exhausted, for example, when you sold the product for me but I have to prove it, right? Uh, and here, uh, what uh, Jazz Photo has to show is that they repaired uh, a product rather than reconstructed a product. So the, the burden is on them to show this, right? So um, uh, the court deals, uh, considers this issue and uh, decides that the uh, what Jazz Photo did by essentially removing uh, the used film uh, and inserting new film and some other activities, of course, too, uh, was permissible repair of the products and not reconstruction. Right? Uh, underlying that conclusion is, is the court's analysis that, that at the end of the day, uh, these disposable camera products essentially came out of the uh, process that Jazz Photo put them through in the same way that they went in. Uh, they're the, basically the same product just with new film uh, and that that was essentially make it, what the court described as a repair um, and that it didn't really matter um, that what the uh, patentee intended uh, was uh, that these be single use. Right. So um, how do you define, how do you discern the difference between repair versus reconstruction? Well, the court does sort of outline these things, and there's a, there's a pattern that has developed over the years. So repair are things like disassembling a device and cleaning it, right? That's clearly repair. Uh, replacing worn parts is repair. Now, that's getting closer to a reconstruction. Uh, but in general, uh, replacing parts that are worn uh, is within the, the ambit of repair and therefore non-infringement. Um, rebuilding of engines, so taking engines entirely apart and putting them back together uh, is also a repair, not a reconstruction. Reconstruction, on the other hand, um, is where a used or a spent article, an article that is, that, you know, is done, has no more uses, is, is uh, revitalized or rebuilt or reconstructed in a way that gives it new uses or different uses or adapts it again to the same use um, uh, when it was essentially beyond uh, use. And then creation of a new product, right? Taking, for example, pieces and parts of, uh, of various engines, putting them together to create a new engine uh, is beyond the scope of uh, repair and that's reconstruction. Right, and so uh, in this case, what the court decided was that really this was just like was more like the replacement of worn parts. That replacing the film uh, from this disposable camera uh, was really just replacing a particular part, um, the film that that uh, prevented this camera from working uh, when it was already exposed. Um, it's an interesting case because it it is a very close case because you could also say um, that because of the nature of these products um, those uh, cameras, these disposable cameras were effectively spent or used. They were no longer any good and that what Jazz Photo was doing was essentially creating almost a new product, right? The second generation of uh, these disposable cameras rather than repairing um, the existing ones. But in any event the court decided um, that uh, this was permissible repair um, and so therefore it would fall on the left side of this chart as opposed to the right side of this chart. So why were they not reconstruction? 
Um, well, they weren't reconstruction because the court, again, found that at the end of the day, what Jazz Photo did was essentially return the devices to their original uh, state um, by primarily replacing the film. Um, and does it matter that the original cameras were not meant to be reused? Well, it matters. It's relevant uh, that the uh, patentee did not intend reuse, but it's not dispositive, right? That the patentee's intent um, is not dispositive to the question of whether it's repair or reconstruction. So how can Fuji avoid the refurbishment of their single-use cameras? So this is an interesting question. How could it do so? Um, well, it could, it could make it much more difficult, for example, to uh, disassemble the product, uh, make it so that you effectively had to destroy the product in order to uh, remove the film. That would prevent uh, the refurbishment. Um, it could uh, patent a process, for example, of, uh, of creating the product or building the product. Uh, that might uh, ensnare the, the jazz photos of the world if they tried to um, uh, reconstruct, repair, um, and, and refresh the, the film. But in general, it's going to be relatively hard um, under Jazz Photo for uh, Fuji to do a lot about um, people refurbishing these single-use cameras. And indeed, if you if you now go uh, into many stores, you can find um, these sorts of refurbished, uh, uh, significantly less expensive uh, disposable cameras uh, on on sale. And that's it for lecture 17.